Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the season four premiere of Monday Night Travel. My name is Julianne Worden, and I am excited to be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick, who is sharing his fall 2023 trip report. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our host this evening, Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. Julianne, nice to see you. And we're kicking off, what, season four. We've been, we're starting <laughs> our fourth year of Monday Night Travel. And of course, we've been traveling for a long time now since the end of the pandemic. And I'll tell you, every time I go to Europe, I meet people who really are thankful to have been part of our Monday Night Travel family, of course, through the pandemic for a couple of years. And now we carry on. So it's good to have everybody back. Thank you for joining us. And I'm just getting over jet lag from a wonderful 20 days in Poland and in Istanbul. And I've put together some slides here. I've got some fun drinks and uh, I've got a lot of friends that just dropped in. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to be, um, it's sort of an odd um, couple of, of countries here. We got Poland and then I flew from Warsaw to Istanbul and I spent an amazing week in Istanbul. Um, during the Poland section, um, I was going to um, cook something nice and Polish and put it in my beautiful Polish uh, ceramic here. This is the classic Polish, uh, beautiful, beautiful ceramic that you'll see on sale and it's hand painted and it's gorgeous, but I didn't get around to cooking anything there, but I'll show you some slides in a minute because I made pierogi. But one thing I do have handy is honestly my favorite vodka in the whole world. I'm no connoisseur of vodka, but I'll tell you, this Polish vodka, it's called bison grass. And it's got a little piece of grass in there <laughs> and it really tastes good. And I've been saving this last little drop for some Monday night travel when I was going to be talking about Poland. So I'm going to be sipping this as we travel through Poland. And of course, in Poland, you say Nastravie. So Nastravie to all of you. Bison grass. Check that out next time you're in a place with a good selection of vodka. And then later on, I'll give you a sneak preview, but we're going to go to Turkey. And of course, you got to have your Turkish chai. So we're going to go chai city here and we'll, uh, we'll have a few other nice little morsels along the way. But right now I want to get right into this. So thanks for joining us. And, um, you know, um, but when, when, uh, the pandemic hit, we had our reservations and our permissions all lined up. We had our film crew booked. And we were going to go to Poland and make two TV shows. And then I was going to fly to Istanbul and update my Istanbul guidebook, this one. And then we shut it down with the pandemic. And thank goodness we were able to actually do this trip in 2023. So we had the crew. We had our Polish friends. We had beautiful weather. We had a very supportive government getting us into everything we wanted to shoot. And we spent two weeks making two half hour shows. They'll be out in a couple of years. Um, we're also going to have a one hour special on Poland. So I want to give you a little sneak preview of what we got. Most people who go to Poland go to Krakow. And uh, it's just the, the fantasy uh, medieval destination of Poland. And uh, it's very easy to get here. It's very tourist friendly. During the day, it's gorgeous. And at night, it just sparkles. We have never in 30 years of making TV shows, me and Simon, uh, walked down a street at twilight at Magic Hour and said, we've got to work the magic of the evening into this uh, show, this coverage. So we spent uh, a lot of time during the magic hour in our six days in Krakow, just enjoying the flood lighting and the people out and just the magical ambiance of this city, Krakow. The modern capital of Poland is Warsaw. The historic capital of Poland is Krakow. And here you find the sort of cultural and spiritual soul of, of Poland. It's a hill called Wawel Hill. And on there, you've got the most important church and the historic castle and the, the, the tombs of all the great characters in old Polish history. And it was so much fun with the TV crew to get there and to be able to share the richness of Polish culture. And I'll tell you, a lot of people don't appreciate Poland. It's one of the bigger countries in Europe. It's one of the more populous countries in Europe. And it's a fascinating and easy country to travel in. We had a beautiful time with our crew. Of course, you know Simon and you know Carl. And in every country, we like to have a local fixer. And that's Tomasz on the left, Tomasz. Uh, and uh, Tomasz is one of our guides. And the day after he was done filming with us, he was with his group, his Rick Steves group, and he was guiding them around Poland. And I'm just so excited to have our 
Poland um, tours up and running now. Uh, you know, when a lot of people are thinking about Poland, I got to say tourism is down in Poland because Americans are concerned about the war. Well, of course, we should be concerned about the war, but there's no reason to be reluctant to travel in Eastern Europe, uh, I would say as long as it's NATO, especially. Um, and we were there, our groups are there, we had a wonderful time, and we felt good because we were helping people, uh, the, the local economy, and because it's been a tough time in tourism, and there is so much to see. And if you're a little bit overwhelmed by the crowds in the rest of Europe, you got to check out what we're calling Central Europe. Uh, it used to be Eastern Europe. I'll, I'll talk about that a little more later. But there's so much cultural richness that we just don't appreciate. Beautiful Art Nouveau. We all know the Jugendstil and the and the Modernisme and the Art Nouveau of Europe. Uh, in Poland, it's it's got they've got their own Art Nouveau and their own great artist. Obviously, this is Stanislaw Wyspiński and you see his windows all over town there's a museum dedicated to his great art and we had fun filming that and then leonardo da vinci in poland what's going on with that well there's a masterpiece by leonardo it's beautifully displayed in a beautiful museum in the old part of krakow and it is the lady with an ermine and uh, it was just really fun to work that beautiful masterpiece into our show but what was most exciting for me was to get into the people corners and just feel the pulse of Poland today. And it's a, it's a ruddy culture. It's a culture that's in the markets with their shopping carts and ready to pick up fresh whatever's grown in the countryside and then you know uh, take it home and cook it up. And uh, we did the same thing. We went shopping there with our friend Tomasz and it was just a, tr a, a treat with the camera, especially to have that shopping experience in the market in Krakow and then Tomasz took us to his house and we made pierogi. And I'm a very good idiot when it comes to uh, teaching somebody how to cook in the kitchen. So I was the student and Tomasz was the, uh, the chef. And I got to learn about making the pierogi from scratch. And it was a great bit to film. And it was the tastiest pierogi I had in two weeks in Poland. And it was just a reminder that there's so much delightful cuisine in every country, and uh, it is yours to sample. You can you can cook it if you want to. The you know uh, food tours and cooking tours are all the rage all over Europe now. And uh, Tomasz actually has our groups uh, come into uh, his home or one of our other guides' home and make this pierogi. And by the way, there you see the beautiful um, ceramic that I was just talking about, and that's a matter of kind of Polish pride. And we can pick that up in our travels. Speaking of Polish pride, bison grass. Yeah. Mm. I learned kielbasa is not a kind of sausage. Kielbasa is sausage. Every sausage is called kielbasa. Uh, I just, it's so funny for me to have been going to a country for decades and to have these Eurekas. Uh, but the Poles are really into their sausages. There's a wonderful array of grilled meats, and we enjoy that. And the cool thing is everything is so dang affordable. You don't need to worry about how much does this cost. You don't need to look for a less expensive bar without a good view. You just consume as you like, and it's half the price you'd expect to pay uh, farther to the west. I have a, a favorite thing to do in Krakow, and it is to visit um, industrial um, sort of a uh, uh, a mining town built by the Soviets. Um, they wanted to take the artistic and cultural capital and give it a little bit of good USSR work ethic. And uh, they turned it into a polluted industrial mess during the 50 years of communism. Uh, thank God they're done with that. Now they're thriving. And that um, communist workers city planned worker city is now um, actually renovated and becoming a trendy place to live. And there are tours in old communist era cars. And we hopped in a car with our guide and we filmed a little joyride around the workers community. And it was a very tiny car. It was like a seemed to have a, a lawnmower mortar in it or something like that. And she was a wonderful guide, a reminder of a lot of the fun things you can do in your travels if you have the information. So we captured that even though we packed into the little tiny car. 
and uh, our crew did whatever they could to get the good angles. We wanted to film the ironworks uh, behind the, the barbed wire fence. And if there's a, a truck parked there and we can climb up there and get a better view, it's hard to keep our cameraman down. We got the, the angles because we're making a TV show to show you the most fascinating slice of Poland. And one very important part of Poland is their experience in the Holocaust and World War II. Of course, that is one of the great tragedies in Western history. And uh, we all know Oscar, um, Oscar Schindler from the movie Schindler's List. Well, he was an industrialist in Krakow, and he had a big heart for Jews who were being sent to the concentration camps. And he risked his life and his family's well-being by sheltering 1,200 Jews and saving 1,200 souls from the concentration camp. Fascinating museum in Krakow to see the factory, Schindler's factory. But really, the factory of death is just outside of Krakow, and that is Auschwitz. This is the most powerful concentration camp experience I've had in my travels. And as a tour organizer and a person who cares about learning from history and who's keenly aware of how privileged and um, lucky and fortunate Americans have been in our lifetime anyways when it comes to knowing what suffering is, we need to, on our travels through Europe, visit a concentration camp. The hardest one to see, the most powerful experience, is one of the, the, the bloodiest ones, and that was Auschwitz. Uh, it's a powerful experience. It's a very crowded experience because there's so many people that want to have this experience. Here's an example of how well sites are organized these days in Europe. You can see there's Polish tours, Spanish tours, English tours, Italian tours, Russian tours, and so on. And you can see by this list, there's a lot of English tours. Every 15 minutes, a tour is scheduled. And here you can see what time it is now and how many free spaces are left on all of these tours. So you'll want to get yourself a tour when you get to Auschwitz. You'll walk under that Arbeit macht frei sign, and then you will have a powerful experience humanizing the reality of the Holocaust. I mean, Hitler killed six million Jews. Half of them died in Poland. Poland was really the tragedy of the Holocaust. And the Nazis, as callous they were to human suffering, they just made an industry out of it. They recycled people's shoes, they recycled people's eyeglasses, uh, and they recycled their, their everything, and then they worked them to death. And if they were no longer able to work, they were sent to the gas chambers and then cremated. Uh, they, could, they, they could just cremate uh, and, and kill thousands of people a day in this mass production factory of death. It's a powerful experience, and you need to have that when you go, uh, especially to Poland, which was the, the haven of the Jews for so long, and then it was the nightmare of the Jews. Poland is thriving right now. I just was very impressed by it. Our hotel in Krakow was just great. The service was great. Young, educated, helpful people, wonderful. This is Cameron Hewitt, um, and um, you've known Cameron because he co-authors a lot of our books. He spearheads our, our uh, Central European program. And uh, Cameron, by the way, along with Tomasz, our guide, uh, hosted a Monday night travel episode back in March of this year, March 20th. And I want to remind you, there's like 150 one hour episodes of Monday Night Travel. And more and more, I'm seeing this as an archive of practical information. In fact, I was just talking with uh, Gabe and Julianne, and the theme for our fourth season now is to let these hour long weekly parties also be um, practical, practical opportunities for people who are turning their travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality to come and learn from our experience. So if you want to learn more about Poland, Cameron's the man. Uh, Cameron and I have been uh, I'm kind of frustrated by the American title of Central Europe. We've always called it Eastern Europe. We call what is properly called Central Europe, what the local people consider Central Europe, we call it Eastern Europe because we live in a Cold War world. Still, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, we're still calling it Eastern Europe because the Iron Curtain, when in our childhood, divided Europe into free West and communist East. The Iron Curtain, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Iron Curtain's gone. 30 years later, we're still seeing it with that border. But local people do not like to be called Eastern Europeans. Poles are Central Europeans. If you look at the map, 
what we call the, the Warsaw Pact region, what we call Eastern Europe, what's covered in this book, Rick Steves' Eastern Europe, is actually Central Europe. And Eastern Europe goes all the way to the Ural Mountains. It's half of Russia, it's Ukraine, it's Georgia, it's Russia, it's the Baltic states. That's Eastern Europe. Uh, so we are changing the name of this book, uh, this next edition, and it's going to be called Central Europe. It's going to confuse our market, but it's out of respect to the people who live there. And uh, it's a, an adjustment for us because all of our careers, we've been calling it Eastern Europe. But no, it is Central Europe. And I'm thankful for Cameron Hewitt for spearheading our program because I'm so proud of the work that our staff does on, East, on Central Europe, making it accessible to our travelers. So remember, you can see Cameron and our friend Tomasz Klimek uh, a Monday Night Travel episode. Just go into the archives at ricksteves.com and Monday Night Travel. It's March 20, 2023, six months ago. Well, Cameron knows all the contacts and Cameron helped us with our TV shoot. And Cameron's right now in Ireland working, um, but he was working on the Poland book and he set up our shoot. And this is Andrew and he's one of our drivers, not one of our drivers, he's a driver and we really like him. So we list him in the book, but he's the kind of person you can connect with if you have our book. And he's wearing our uh, very popular Keep on Traveling t-shirt as is Cameron. Well, um, Warsaw is three hours north of Krakow, we get to Warsaw. And Warsaw is far and away the big muscular city of Poland. And it's thriving now. But what's really poignant to me is, in 1945, the city was uninhabitable. There was barely a building standing. It was just shells of buildings. You maybe remember the, the, the scene like with the drone shot going over the bombed out city in the movie The Pianist. Well, today, it's been rebuilt, Nastravie, to the Poles for re rebuilding their country after World War II. And to visit it today is a celebration of how far that country has come. Of course, they went from Nazi nightmare to communist nightmare, so they certainly didn't get liberated in 1945, but they went right into the Soviet camp, and then they had 50 miserable years under communism. Uh, this was a, a skyscraper built um, at the request of Joseph Stalin, the dictator in Russia, and um, it was a gift to the Polish people, uh, but the Polish people didn't like it because it just reminded them they were ruled by Moscow, and people nicknamed this Stalin's penis, and it was the only skyscraper for, for years in the town, and it just towered up there, and uh, uh, now, when you go back, you find Stalin's penis is pretty much hidden by a lot of taller skyscrapers, glassier skyscrapers, more graceful skyscrapers. But the only souvenir I took home this year from, from Poland, I, I believe, was my Stalin's penis stockings. And uh, I just love people to ask me, well, what's that? And I go, that's Stalin's penis. Um, so uh, if you want to go to Warsaw, now you know the name of the oldest skyscraper and in its day the tallest building in what is now called Central Europe. Imagine this is called the Royal Route and it was totally flattened. I mean totally literally destroyed and today it's been rebuilt amazingly and it's thriving and most of the people there the war is old news. I guess I'm old enough to just think in terms of, wow, you rebuilt after the war in 1945. But younger people, it's in the history books. Uh, and uh, today, the old town is just a, a, a thriving tourism center, uh, lots of shops, lots of music. And when you look at a church like this, when you look at the windows, when you look at the carvings, when you look at the statues, all of that was rebuilt. All of that was rebuilt from paintings. They had no serious records. They just had artists' paintings of their cities. And they rebuilt it, and they rebuilt it beautifully. One thing great about Polish culture is Frederick Chopin. And Chopin spent most of his career in Paris. But the legend is that when Chopin was composing in Paris, he could still hear the wind in the willow trees of his beloved home country in Poland. And here in the center of the capital city, we have a dramatic statue of Poland with the willow tree blowing over his head. And every Sunday at noon and at four o'clock throughout the summer, they have concerts, Chopin concerts in the park. And I saw that 30 years ago or 40 years ago, my first time to Poland, and we filmed it just a couple weeks ago. And it was such a thrill to be there with all the 
young people, old people, fancy people, simple people, families, retired people, babies, you name it, filling the park and enjoying Chopin. One thing I love with our Poland tours, and by the way, we just started our Poland tour program, and I think we took six tours this year. We have wonderful Polish guides. And um, one thing we do, and this was a, a, it's a salon concert, and I love to think that we're hosting a salon concert. We've got, we fill the place up. It's our, it's the hotel we stay in while we're in Warsaw. It's called the, the uh, Chopin Boutique Bed and Breakfast Hotel. And every night, the man who runs the hotel puts on a salon concert and a salon concert is just a reminder that you know back before we had recorded music and radio and all that before we had spotify uh people never even heard an orchestra unless they lived in a big city and they would hear salon music you'd have an orchestral piece transcribed for piano and violin and then they would gather together in the nicest home in that town and the pianist and the violinist would play an orchestra piece by chopin or liszt or beethoven or whoever and uh, i just find that very romantic and that we could gather, this is one of our Rick Steves tour groups, in a, in a room like this, and hear a great violinist and a great pianist playing Chopin in the city of Chopin, Warsaw, is just a thrill. It was really fun for me as a tour pro, a TV producer to come in an hour before the concert, and we uh, fixed up the room just really nice for TV, got to know the musicians, I got to play the piano a little bit uh, with this wonderful violinist. And then our group comes in, they sit down, and I explain to them, please ignore the camera and uh, let's enjoy the concert. And we've got it, and that's going to be coming up in our TV show. Getting back to World War II, uh, Warsaw, Poland was the biggest Jewish city, I believe. Warsaw was the biggest Jewish city in the world. Uh, before the creation of Israel. And uh, lots and lots of Jews lived in Poland because Jews had it relatively good in Poland. Uh, it just pissed off Hitler. And he came there and just took it out on the Jews and had a horrible ghetto experience. The, the Jews were just, they knew they were doomed. They had an uprising, they were slaughtered, they were taken to the concentration, they were just killed. And then the remaining people who were not Jews, they were just Poles they had an uprising too, knowing that they were going to die also. It was a desperate time, and uh, a huge percent of the city was killed. And, you know, Hitler was so angry with Warsaw, he just said, destroy the whole city. The Soviets were coming, Hitler was going to retreat, but you don't want to retreat without destroying Warsaw first. The Russians waited on the other side of the river, just watching the Nazis destroy the city and then retreat. And then the Russians came in and took it over. It's just a disgusting time in history. And to go there and to learn about that is fascinating. And what's poignant to me is when you go to the museums in a place like Warsaw, there's so much history from the dark stories of, uh, uh, of their recent past. There's so much destruction that very little actually survives. Very powerful museums, but not a lot of artifacts. Very scant artifacts because so much was destroyed. But what does survive? is the humanity of it, the, the memory, the, the poignant notion or understanding that there were real people, real people, countless real people that fell against the Soviets and against the Nazis in this difficult time. A visit to Warsaw is powerful in so many ways. Uh, you'll work up an appetite. And if you want to have a sort of a down-home diner experience, Certain people love these places, certain people don't. I kind of like them, they're called milk bars. All over Poland, you can find milk bars. And it's just a cafeteria, it's a worker's cafeteria. It was designed in communist times so workers could go out to eat on their, on their skinny little wages. And they survive today. It's basic meat and potatoes, and a meal here will cost you three or four dollars. Unless you add a little bit of bison grass vodka, then it'll cost you five or six dollars. Or if you want to go get a cappuccino by Starbucks, it'll cost you $10. I got to say, just between you and me, I love my Starbucks. And uh, I can pull off of the freeway anywhere in Poland. I astounded my crew. I said, I need the cappuccino. And I said, just pull off. Okay, there's a mini market going there. And I, <laughs> I knew they would be stocked. Starbucks has amazing market penetration. And it's not just because of me. Or Simon. Look how thrilled Simon is to get a... <laughs> But we had to get our coffee. Okay, um, Poland has a remarkable vibrancy today. And you go down by the river, everybody's out. 
we had so much fun just strolling the river and filming. Uh, you know, boats are permanently moored that are kind of like disco party boats. It just is a lot. There's so much fun energy in Poland today. And there's great foodie opportunities. And as I said, you can have gourmet food in Poland or you can have cheap food in Poland and just not even think about the price. It's just great. And Cameron is a foodie. And Cameron, you know, spearheads the writing of these books on Eastern Europe. And there's so many great restaurants in Warsaw to check out. And we wanted to film it. When we go into a restaurant, a lot of times our cameraman, Carl, takes our little camera instead of our big camera because it's more mobile and less op op intrusive. Um, and uh, we just had, uh, this is just a very noisy, high energy, edgy, happening um, sort of, um, uh, you know, hip restaurant. And uh, the food was great and it was gone. I'll tell you, there was not a, you, there was not a scrap left. All right, so from Warsaw, we travel north to the Baltic coast and we stop at a town called Turin. Turin is famous for two things, Copernicus, and it's famous for gingerbread. And we happen to go to a little medieval, you know, entertainment education center that all of the kids go on field trips. And we saw the costumed actor talk about baking gingerbread in the Middle Ages and why they did it and how they had the spices and why the spices were possible because of the Hanseatic League and how the spices kept things fresh through the time when there was no refrigeration and so on. And the kids went in and they rolled their gingerbread cookies and they popped them into the oven. It was just a beautiful experience we got to film. A few miles farther down the road, you've got an amazing castle called Malbork, M-A-L-B-O-R-K. And this is a castle of, from the Teutonic Knights. And these Teutonic Knights were um, crusaders and uh, they did their thing down in the Holy Land, protecting all the pilgrims and so on. And then they went back to Poland and they became sort of morphed into mercenaries. They were just um, kind of like, um, probably like the Wagner soldiers today. They're just looking for a war to fight and wanted to make some money and they've got good weapons. Uh, and um, the local people hired them to um, convert the pagans into Christianity. And they did that and they succeeded. And then they thought, you know, we kind of like it here. So they established a Teutonic um, domain and uh, their leader was called the Grand Master. And they built this amazing fort and it is the biggest and i'm i'm really happy right here because we drove all the way uh, that morning from warsaw and i wanted to get there before the sun went down but i wanted that last hour when the light is really warm and the light was warm and the bricks were rosy and we had to kind of crawl through the bushes to find a place to put the tripod down where where i could be properly lit and situated with the castle and the river and the reflections in the river it was uh, you don't see it from this angle because i was i mean the camera should have been lower for the video but man it was just the opportunity of a lifetime for a TV host doing a little stand up open for Malbork Castle. And this was a castle. Look at it's a beautiful castle. Today. Look at the castle in 1945. I mean, it was just bombed to smithereens. And then it was all rebuilt. And it was rebuilt so beautifully that I was moved to sing just a little song. It's just a, a spontaneous bit of music I wanted to share with you after being inspired by this big, big pile of bricks. <laughs> okay. It's a brick yeah. house, Hanseatic League, Teutonic Knights, it's a brick house, with a big moat too. Wow. If you want more, my CD will be uh, for sale at the end of the event tonight. We take checks, cash and credit cards. I mentioned Hanseatic League, and whenever you mention Hanseatic League, people's eyes glaze over. But I get turned on by thoughts of the Hanseatic League because it was in the Middle Ages when merchants wanted a big centralized government and there was none. And if you're a merchant, you want to trade and you want stability, you want uniform weights and measures, you want no customs, no duties, you want the same currency everywhere, you want stability. And if there's just medieval fiefdoms, all these little petty dukedoms and fiefdoms and all these robber baron castles and 20 duties to get your chairs to the market in Frankfurt when you go down the Rhine River, you wish there was a big state. That's why merchants were proponents of centralized governments as Europe moved 
uh, haltingly from feudal um, divisive, the feudal little kingdoms uh, to major countries that had centralized governments. You know, that's why there's the European Union today is because merchants want free trade. You can, if you have a big free trade zone of 300 million people, you can compete with the United States, which is a big free trade zone of 300 million people. You know, that's 20 or $25 trillion a year of trade. This is much less than that. But in the absence of centralized states in medieval Europe, you had altogether now the Hanseatic League. And the Hanseatic League was all of these little ports and trading cities that decided to work together. They banded together because there was no big countries. They had their free trade agreements. They had they made their lighthouses. They chased down the pirates and they established the trading norms. They boycotted ports that didn't join them. And this is where it happened in Northern Europe, the Hanseatic League. You'll see it all over. If there's a great city like Bergen on the west coast of Norway there, it's a great city because it's a Hanseatic League city. And this is um, Gdansk. And Gdansk is an amazing city. And Gdansk is the northern uh, trade city of Poland. And if you look at this, this is on the ceiling of a, of a trade, sort of a, um, a guild hall. And you can see the Vistula River coming down on the right with all the loaded barges. They come to Gdansk and all the merchants are there shaking hands and making deals. And then on the left, it's transferred into big ships and it's out into the Baltic Sea and all the way to London. Uh, that is Northern European trade right there. And <laughs> if that's not enough to get you all excited, I don't know what is. Look at that ceiling. That painting I just showed you was up in the ceiling in this beautiful room. And I got to have Agnieszka, Agnes, our local guide, explain it to me. And then the camera was rolling, and that's going to be on our TV show. So this is the city that was made rich and beautiful by that trade because it was in the Hanseatic League, Gdansk. The Germans called it Danzig. Uh, and um, Gdansk was pretty much destroyed in World War II and rebuilt. And today it is one of the great surprises, one of the underrated cities in Europe. Uh, and it's really in itself a reason to go to Poland. Here we have an example of modern architecture that mirrors the medieval architecture. Uh, this is um, uh, across the river, and you can see there were a lot of those Hanseatic kind of houses, these houses that were bombed out, and they built modern houses, hotels, you know, apartment flats, uh, condominiums, whatever, um, and they had a certain kind of code, and it works, it actually works, and you've got the modern overlay in that energy, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful boardwalk and, and uh, uh, vibrancy at night, and I just really enjoyed being in Gdansk. If you're into history, Gdansk is famous because of the Lenin shipyard. And the Lenin shipyard is where the Solidarity Union uh, was born with the leadership of Lech Walesa. And uh, this was where you could say the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union sparked. It was right here that the workers got together and they said enough. And it was called the Lenin shipyard. Uh, now it's called something different, but they took over the plant basically and they had their famous strike and they had their charismatic leader, Vlek Valenza. Uh, and he was just a working class plumber and he got in there and these guys befuddled the USSR and they inspired Central Europe to rise up and demand their freedom. And it really is quite a story. And that story is told in the great European Solidarity Center. That's what this building is. It's a marvelous museum. And that is one of the highlights of traveling anywhere in Poland, certainly in Gdansk. For me, as a tour operator, like right now today, we've got more than 100 buses on the road in Europe. Each one of those buses has a wonderful driver, a wonderful Rick Steves guide, and 25 or 26 or 28 travelers. And every time I travel anywhere in Europe, if you think there's 100 buses all over Europe, that's a lot of tours, I can bump into them. I don't plan it, they're just there. And when I see them, we get a photograph. And what makes me happy is the smiles on those faces. These are the people that join us on our tours. And they're smiling because they've got a great itinerary. They like the style of the company they've uh, decided to uh, invest in for their vacation. And most importantly, because their guide is 
a, a wonder worker. And uh, we've got like 150 guides. They do a thousand tours a year. And I'm so thankful for these guides. They just love their work. They're passionate. And by the end of the tour, <laughs> they've, got, they've got lifelong friends out of that group that went on their Rick Steves tour. So these are some people enjoying uh, Rick Steves Poland tour in 2023, just last month. Okay, from Warsaw, I got to fly to Istanbul. So I'm gonna take my last sip of um, bison grass. Mm, God, I love that stuff. Remember bison grass, okay? It's uh, I, I'm I'm surprised I'm enthusiastic about a particular brand of vodka, but give this a whirl. <laughs> I get I get a free case of this every time I hold it up on TV. No, I I, I really uh, have no connection with bison grass. I can't even say the name of the company. Zubrowska, but it's good stuff. But now we're going to go to Turkey. So I've got to change gears, and the drink there is called Rocky. There's Rocky. You can read it right there, Rocky. And um, Rocky, if you ask a if you ask a, a Greek person, is Uzo. Uh, and I don't have a bottle of Rocky, but for me, Rocky and Uzo are about the same. So I'm just going to have a little Rocky right now because when I think Turkey, I got to say I think Rocky. And to to enjoy Rocky, you pour it and you have about a third. So that's your fire water or your liqueur or your, your, your alcohol. And then you pour this and there's a way to do it. And if you do it really well, you, you, get, a, you get a stripe of cloudiness. And I don't know if I can do it. I'm not a chemist. Okay, so you just fill it up. There you go. And then this is your Rocky. This is your ouzo, and all over the Mediterranean, there's that anise drink. It's just that licorice flavor, and it's just a delightful um, social drink to sip. That's what I love about Rocky. I was, in fact, I'll, I'll introduce you to a guide of, of mine in, in Istanbul in a moment, but uh, they make a big point that a in key ingredient is conviviality, friends getting together sipping, enjoying the moment. And that when I drink my Rocky, I think of the friends I've got in Turkey. So that's my my uh, my social drink. But then when you are out and about, it's all about chai. And that's a key word you learn in Turkey. And you got these delightful Turkish teacups. And um, I don't know if you're supposed to rick, mix Rocky and chai, but um, I always wanted to get a nice tea glass to take home. And I got a couple of these. It's the souvenir I took home from my trip. I just got back last week from Turkey. So I'm just pleased to take you to Turkey right now. And this is a city of 20 million people. I mean, 20 million people um, flying in. And uh, the air, everything is mammoth in scale. Turkey is, it's a, it's a superpower. The Turkic people stretch all the way to Mongolia. If you looked at an ethnographic map of, the, of Eurasia, there's a whole swath of Turkic people beyond Turkey. And Istanbul is sort of the cultural center where, from where Turkishness emanates in a lot of ways. And it is a mighty, mighty economy, and they build big stuff. This is the airport. It's the biggest airport I've ever been in. You get downtown, and you're just swept away by the history. And you get to the hotel, and they've got this a ridiculous over the top welcome of flower petals on your bed. It took me, it took me a long time to scoop up all those flower petals just so I could organize the room so it was usable. But they're excited that they had a visitor. So I had my flower petals on the bed. But this is Istanbul right here. It's where Europe and Asia come together. It's for 400 years, it was the leading city in Christendom, the leading city in Europe when Europe was in what is often called the Dark Ages. I've got a wonderful partner in Turkey named Lolly and her husband, Tan, and they organize our Turkey tour program. And we were, I was just, I had six days in Istanbul and every minute of those days I was working on this book. Uh, there's four cities in Europe that I think deserve a one week tour. 
that we offer with our tour program, but regardless, four cities are that important. London, Paris, Rome, and Istanbul is right up there. And that's why I just love this book. I spent six days, essentially did everything in the book, uh, except for the hotels, all the restaurants, and visited all the restaurants and did all the tours and the sightseeing. And uh, this is a, a restaurant here that is a locanta style. That means it's cafeteria style. I really like that because you see what is cooking, you point and order, it's cheap, it's fresh, it's good, it's Turkish. And this one is near and dear to hippies because this was the pudding shop. And from the pudding shop, people took the hippie bus all the way to Kathmandu back in the 70s. I did that. And uh, clippings on the walls are filled with that kind of memory. And I remember the sutlach. I'm holding a bowl of um, rice pudding there. And I don't know a lot of Turkish words, but I sure know the Turkish word for rice pudding, sutlach. Uh, this man uh, is just, he's so into the, the heritage of his, uh, of his restaurant. I wrote the book on the hippie trail from that experience back in 1978. I'm sorry the book's not for sale. I just published a bunch of them as gifts for public television and we're basically done with that. But I will be bringing out the book in a better edition in the near future, but I can't say when, but I just had the trip of a lifetime going to India and the pudding shop was literally the jumping off spot. And uh, this is one of our guides and uh, she was taking me around. And of course we had to have our baklava and our glass of chai. Here is the historic center of Istanbul. This is the Hippodrome. It was the old ancient Roman race course. And you've got the Egyptian obelisk and you've got the great mosques around here. And uh, this is a reminder that when Rome fell, uh, it split and it died in the West and it lived on for centuries in the East. And it, the first emperor there was Constantinople. And this city was named after him. Constant, and the first emperor was, Con, the emperor then was Constantine and the city was Constantinople, today's Istanbul. Um, and when you go underneath the street, this is a cistern. It's called the Basilica Cistern. Uh, and it's because it's got all of these columns like a basilica. And this is an underground water container because it was a city of 100,000 people that needed water. And uh, it's quite a sight to see. And it's an example, if you go underneath, you go from the Muslim world to the medieval Christian world to the ancient Roman world. Uh, very, very famous church is the Blue Mosque. And when you go into the Blue Mosque, you understand uh, uh, why they call it the Blue Mosque. And that's actually turquoise. And it was named by the Turks. The Turks liked that color, uh, not the Turks, the French, and they called it the Turkish color, turquoise. Um, big deal when you're in Turkey is the history with Ataturk. Ataturk was the founder of modern Turkey who gave them their constitution in 1923. And uh, I just love Ataturk because he created a modern pluralistic society out of the medieval chaotic old man of Europe, the uh, Ottoman Empire. And um, part of that constitution was uh, legally required separation of mosque and state. And I just think it's so important to have a separation of church and state and in the Muslim world, a separation of mosque and state. And Ataturk did that 100 years ago this year um, in Turkey. Uh, today, Turkey is ruled by a guy named Erdogan and Erdogan is sort of, in some ways, the anti-Ataturk. And Erdogan is a right-winger. He's, he's um, chipping away at democracy. He's supported by fundamentalists who want to bring the country back into a theocracy like Iran. Uh, he's artfully staying in power by not overreaching but it's scary what's going on in Turkey from a civil liberties point of view, from a freedom of the press point of view, and from a separation of mosque and state point of view. Having said that, I was very curious to go to both Poland and Istanbul this month, this last month, and see, feel the, the pulse of the political situation. Both are ruled by governments that are not in favor, really, of true democracy. They're right-wing governments, and I find that they are having enough support to win elections by dubious ways, but they do have a lot of support and uh, the country seemed to be relatively well run. And Erdogan is in power. He's been in power for 20 years and it looks like he's gonna stay in power for a while longer. But in Turkey, there's two kinds of people politically, Erdogan supporters and Ataturk supporters. And if a hotel puts up a photograph or a painting of Ataturk, 
it's it's uh, considered a political statement. This place is interested in civil liberties and democracy, and the other one is interested in uh, a Muslim conservative society. Lolly explained to me with using six newspapers how every newspaper has a political bent. I guess just like in our society, and it's important for a thinking person to know that and to read both sides of the story and then make up their own mind. When you're out on the streets in Turkey, every, not everybody, but you'll see people discussing. It's a, it's an interesting time politically, and there's a lot of hard feelings, and there's also a lot of uh, inflation, and there's uh, a lot of fear. Um, inflation is interesting. Um, They've got about 50 or 100 percent inflation every year. In our book, it would say in the latest edition of our Istan book, it would say the tram ride costs three euros. Now the tram ride costs 25 euros because it's four years of difference. I mean, it's just crazy, the inflation. And if you look at the uh, menus, you see that uh, they print up the menu and then you've got erasable uh, numbers and they can just you know, sponge off the numbers and write in this month's numbers for what they're going to charge. Right now, there's 25 Turkish lira in a dollar. So, you know, um, uh, uh, a plate, a grilled meat plate would cost you about $3 and a salad would cost you about $1. Some communities are conservative and do not have alcohol. Some communities are progressive and do have alcohol. This would be in a hip sort of corner of town where you've got fewer women wearing scarves and more pubs selling beer. Across the river, you might find a place where women are wearing scarves and there's no alcohol for sale. So it just varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, if you look at the prices there, a beer cost about $2. That's a good example of how expensive it is in Turkey today, $2 for a beer. If there, there was a big soccer game while I was there and the police were out in force. Anytime there's a big gathering of people, the police will be there to make sure it stays orderly. Um, it's that kind of a society, 20 million people. Anytime something was frustrating to me when I'm in Istanbul this last uh, week, I just got home literally less than a week ago um, and I was there for seven days. Uh, I kept thinking 20 million people. I mean, how big's your city? You know, we have traffic jams in my city and it's less than a million. If you got traffic jam in Istanbul, 20 million people. That's all you just think, 20 million people. How do you control the crowds? Lots of police, lots of barriers. Uh, there's a barrier there and I got used to seeing those barriers all over town. And they're not living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I mean, there's all sorts of difficult things going on in countries around Turkey. Uh, lots of Syrian ref uh, lots of Syrian refugees. This cute poor little girl is a Syrian, and her parents are probably desperate, and she's sitting uh, there selling Kleenex. Uh, and uh, it's just a reminder: life is hard, and life's hard in Turkey, anyways. And then they're inundated with a lot of refugees from chaos in the Middle East. One thing impressive about Turkey is the transit. Ah, I just love the transit. In fact, I, I wasn't prepared to show you this, but I think I can find it. I am so enamored with Turkey's public transit system that I, I, I uh, roughed up a, a schematic map, and I was just talking with Dave, our map maker, and we're going to require people to get good with the public transit because this thing goes every four minutes. It laces together everything you want. It costs less than a dollar for a ride, and it's not susceptible to traffic jams. If you had all the money in the world and you took a taxi, if you had a private chauffeur with a limo, if you knew it's good for you, you'd leave him at the hotel and you'd get on that tram. So in the new edition of our Istanbul book, it's gonna really be public transportation driven because that empowers you to get around the city in a beautiful way. It's an amazing infrastructure. And what the government has done in the last 20 years under Erdogan, is renovate the city and take um, slums and industrial wastelands and turn them into beautiful parks. Look at this, the Golden Horn. It's just a delightful place. And I was, I've been going there for 30, 40 years, and uh, this was unthinkable a little while ago. Uh, the old town is, there's very little of it left. Here's a good example of a building that's yet to be renovated. It's for sale, uh, but everything around it has been purchased and invested in and made nice. Uh, the old, atmospheric, rustic Istanbul 
it's pretty hard to find, to be honest. This is the most historic church, the leading church in Christendom for a long, long time. It was made 1500 years ago by Emperor Justinian uh, back in uh, Roman times, uh, Hagia Sophia. And then when the Muslims invaded and took over, they, it was no longer a church, it became a mosque and they gave it minarets. Uh, and then it became a museum. And then with Ataturk's rule, Ataturk, I mentioned, was more right-wing, more fundamentalist, more in cahoots with the religious uh, conservative elements in their society, like the right-wing element in our society, by the way. Um, he turned that museum back into a functioning mosque. So today, you can go to Hagia Sophia, and you don't pay 20 bucks to get in, but you have huge lines, and you are going into a functioning mosque. And during the call to prayer, during prayer time five times a day, it's full of worshipers praying, and it spills out into the streets, and you can actually see people on the rugs outside praying at that most important church in Istanbul. Look at this beautiful church, 1500 years old, built to face Jerusalem and then taken over and turned into a mosque. So they moved the prayer net just a little bit. So instead of Jerusalem, it faces Mecca and they can still worship under those great domes. Uh, you know, when you go inside, you got your crowd barriers, keeping everybody in the right place. Before, when I went there, there was no carpet because it was a museum. Now there's a carpet there because people kneel and pray a lot. Uh, it's a, and everybody's walking around in stocking feet. And uh, it's just a beautiful experience. And of course, this is more of a religious society now. So you've got um, volunteers who are devout Muslims who would love to introduce you to their religion. Uh, beautiful people uh, speak very good English and can answer your questions about Islam and about civil liberties and about the place of women and what's with the scarf and all that sort of thing. Uh, when you travel to Turkey, you get a good look at a moderate Islamic nation that's caught in the middle between East and West. Hmm. Next to the Hagia Sophia is the Top Copy Palace. Very well organized, lots of travelers, lots of lines, famous because of the harem famous because of the top copy dagger and the crown jewels of that country, and really a destination for Muslim travelers. And it's hard to know who's Turkish and who's a Muslim tourist. You know, the Western tourists, just by looking at them, but actually there's a lot of visitors from all over the Islamic world that come to Istanbul because it's such a cultural and religious center. And here you've got artifacts, you've got relics, you've got, you know, a hair of Mohammed's beard, just like you have Christian relics in Christian churches, you've got Muslim relics uh, in, uh, in Muslim mosques. What you have in a Muslim mosque that you don't have in a church is a cleric who is saying or singing verses from the Quran 24 7 every minute of every day for generation after generation after generation somebody is sitting here reading out loud from the quran as people visit and understand what they're looking at which is an advantage if you're a muslim i don't understand a lot of that because it's not a culture that i'm very familiar with from the european coast of istanbul there are boats that go all the time because there's millions of people that commute every day from the Asian side. And you can hop on that boat and in 20 minutes you are in Asia. I'm in Asia right now. And then you've got beautiful cities to check out. We have a chapter in our Istanbul book, which is a day trip over to Asia. And it goes by boat from Istanbul to Uskadar and then down to a place called Katakoy and then back to Istanbul. And when you go over there, it's just a wonderful slice of life experience. And it just happens that our friends, Lali and Tan, who run our Turkish tour program, we've got a thriving Turkish tour program. We take about 20 tours a year, I believe, around Turkey, a 13 day best of Turkey tour. And also we have one week Istanbul tours. And uh, I just love visiting Tan and Lali. And I've been visiting uh, their, uh, their home, their beautiful home for 20 years. And for the last 16 years, I've been checking in on their two wonderful boys. Now they're 14 and 16 years old. And we had a lot of fun just, I had a lot of fun just getting out of the tourist mode. And uh, it was really fun because I got to see Turkish parents dealing with teenage boys. You know, and I just, they, we had this fun dinner and the boys were just crazy. And then uh, after a while, they, uh, uh, Zuzu, the, the 16 year old, wanted to show us his uh, room and uh, play the drums. And so, okay, let's go upstairs. And uh, we went up there and, and I just sat there for a, a, a wonderful few minutes. And I just enjoyed the reality of parenting in Turkey, which is a lot like parenting anywhere else in the world. Here's a little drum concert 
by Zuzu in Istanbul. You ready? Here we go. It's just 37 seconds. <laughs> So then I asked him to play Dear Maker by Led Zeppelin and he had never heard it before and we found it and we turned it on that loud and he played Dear Maker, which is m my favorite Led Zeppelin song. And it happened to be Lolly and, and uh, Ton's uh, Fall in Love anthem or something. And Zuzu played the drums to it. So there's a talented drummer in the middle of Istanbul. Big news in Istanbul is what's called the Galata Port. The cruise ships are back. There's stability now after they had their coup, which messed up their tourism six or eight years ago. And um, today it's a beautiful port, very, very modern with massive cruise ships. And what's unique about this cruise port that I've never seen anywhere else is there's a collapsible wall. So when the cruise ships are not there, the wall's down and everybody in those restaurants gets the view. When the cruise ship docks, like right where we're standing here, there could be a huge ship there would be the wall that goes up and then you got customs and it blocks off the ship from the people until they go through customs. But what an amazing new part of the city and not my cup of tea. I was there. This is a huge ship. Look at the size of that thing and think of the industry that that brings into the town. It's so much fun for me as a guidebook writer to be able to go around and uh, bump into people who are using our book and having a great time. And Istanbul has changed a lot. And I don't think I, I can't remember working as hard as I did. Excuse me. For six days straight, every waking minute on this book so we can make it better than ever. So you can go to Istanbul and have a marvelous time. Our groups again, I got to meet one of our tour groups. Uh, this is uh, uh, a tour led by Mine. That's Mine, the woman on the far left in the middle with a big smile. Well, every woman's got a big smile on that, on that tour group there, but Mine is on the far left. I took a tour led by her 10 or 15 years ago, and it was so fun to see her again and uh, how great she was doing with her group. But this group is well into their one week best of Istanbul tour. And by the looks on their faces, they're having a good time. On the other hand, here are two American travelers with a local Turkish guide. And for $300, you can rent a guide for an entire day, a private guide, and then have your expert um, historian, guide, shopper, consultant, uh, uh, translator, friend, whatever, right with you. And I just think it's a great spurge if you can afford it. It costs about $300 a day to hire a guide, and you've got the luxury of your own private guide in one of the greatest cities on earth. I love this street here. It goes through the more modern part of town, Is and it is so crowded that uh, for a good part of the day, the tram can't even go on those tracks there. But day and night, this is a thriving street. And I just it just energizes me to be able to see this street. And you can't miss it. It's an entire chapter. It's like a 20 page chapter in this book. And you can spend a whole day enjoying Istikal Kadasi. And if you want to get above the crowds, lots of um, bars and restaurants have rooftop terraces where you can enjoy a nice meal or a nice drink with a nice view of the place where Europe and Asia come together. Or you can go down a side street and check out an antique shop. And I think I discovered a Picasso. Look at that thing back there. Pretty cool. Or you can just meet the chocolate man and he's got all sorts of different chocolate and he'd love for you to try lots of samples, lots of samples. Or if you want a cigarette, you can go to the cigarette shop and you can learn how bad cigarette smoking is for you. Uh, we have warnings on our cigarette packages. When you go to much of Europe, you've got very graphic warnings. And I want to I want you to just all if you're squeamish or you don't want to see something very, very gross, close your eyes for about 15, 20 seconds here. But um, all over Europe, you've got oh, horrifying photographs of what happens if you smoke cancer and uh, uh, all sorts of problems and it and then also impotence here's a 
a limp cigarette. And, you know, it says uh, if you if you smoke, you'll, you'll be impotent. And what's interesting to me is the worst selling cigarettes in Turkey are the ones with the limp cigarettes on the package. They're all just about the same sort of for your health. But Turks would much rather have some of these other cigarettes uh, if they're going to risk their health. OK, you can open your eyes again. Another thing about uh, traveling in Turkey that I found interesting is you don't really go to banks, you go to ATM machines. Now they line them up on the squares and that's where you do your changing of money. But I do want to remind you anywhere in Europe, this is, by the way, a, a photograph from Poland, but I wanted to remind you, even in the United no, not in the United States, but anywhere in Europe, anywhere in your travels, they will ask you when you change money with your credit card, and we use our credit cards more and more these days. Some countries don't even go with cash. They use the credit card all the time. They will routinely ask you, do you want it in the local currency or do you want it in dollars? And a lot of people just think, well, thank you, young man. I think I'll have that in dollars. They're ripping you off. It's not the waiter that's ripping you off or the merchant. It's the bank. They have to have this option. And naive travelers say, sure, I'll take it in dollars. But what that does, if I understand correctly, it gives that um, transaction an opportunity to give you a bad rate. Always take the local currency and you'll save a lot of money. So whatever the currency was in this one, you want to pay in PLN. That would be the, the Polish money rather than in dollars. Oh, man, just to sit down at a little table and enjoy being in Istanbul is so much fun for me just to wander the streets, to make friends, to try the local pizza, to just people watch, to be out in the evening when everybody else is out, to go to the trendy corners. This is a, a trendy district. It's called Chihangir, Chihangir, and uh, everybody's out, and it's just really... Um, sort of the, 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 the up and coming district. And uh, it's a chance just to feel the pulse of today's Turkey, today's Turkey. One thing I really worked hard to do while I was there was find local guides who I liked, who were just really understood teaching the way I like to teach and who were honest and reliable business people so I could put them in this book. I really like to be able to be a conduit between hardworking locals and smart travelers. And one day, for instance, I booked all of these guides, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, in one day, and I spent 90 minutes with each guide. And I had arranged more rendezvous as I was doing my rounds. And, you know, at, at uh, you know, nine o'clock, I'd be with her. At 10.30, I'd be with him. At noon, I'd be with him. At 1.30, I'd be with her. At three o'clock, I'd be with him. And at 4.30, I'd be with her. And uh, it was such a great day. And I had to, it was sort of like speed dating for the travel writer. And I chose my favorite guides out of that group. And now they will all be in this book. And I've negotiated a good price where you go directly with that guide. You save money. They make more because they don't have a middleman taking a commission. And that's how we like to do it with the Rick Steves guidebook. The big shopping center for a lot of tourists is called the Grand Bazaar. And the Grand Bazaar is, uh, goes all the way back to medieval times. And uh, it's a crowded situation. This is one of my guides. And I noticed she was holding her purse the smart way. If you've got a purse and you're in a crowded area, remember you're a target. Hold it under your arm and tight. Uh, zip up your wallets, uh, put it in your front pocket, button down, whatever. Just remember tourists are targeted by pickpockets anywhere and especially in touristy areas that are very crowded. There's so much development there that all of the big businesses moving in to the market and entire souks or entire shopping districts are being turned into fancy restaurants and so on. But if you go to the fringes of the Grand Bazaar, you'll find the old magic of the Grand Bazaar still there. This is a poor man's Wall Street. These are all money changers. And it's just a cacophony of sound as all of them are on their, their phones and they're making deals with the currency exchange. And you wander through that and you realize this has been going on right here for a long, long time. Little merchants doing their things. This is a wonderful merchant that I've uh, met 10 or 15 years ago and put him in the book. And uh, uh, it was fun to revisit him. And there's a photograph of him in the book and he's there today and he gets tourists dropping in and he demonstrates how he will melt the gold and turn it into bars and sell it to, to other people. And uh, when I was with him, I had a little chance just to do a quick video, but here's a chance to meet my favorite uh, uh, goldsmith in the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, who is doing the same thing his dad did and his dad's dad did right here in this far corner of the Grand Bazaar.
Raihan is still doing the craft like his father did. This is the soul of the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul and it needs to survive. I just love finding those reminding me that the old world, the, the traditions do survive. They're resilient, but you got to dig for it. And that's what I try to find in the guidebooks. Uh, you know, the most beautiful uh, mosque in the whole city is the Mosque of Suleiman the Magnificent. And it's out beyond the Grand Bazaar. It was so beautiful to be able to come here. And while I was here, the call to prayer uh, rung out. And the call to prayer is a kind of a, it's, an, it's a cacophony. Every minaret is hollering. In, a, in kind of a harsh way to Western ears, but it's a beautiful sound when you understand the context. And here I just was sort of inspired when the call to prayer rung out. Forgive the audio, the audio is not very good on this video clip, but it's gonna last for about a minute and you can hear the call to prayer. And then I wanna remind you when they say there is one God and he is Allah, that kind of freaks out a few people. But if you understand it in the proper context, it's something that people of any faith can celebrate. Uh, check this out. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in Istanbul, deep in Istanbul, and the city has lots of mosques. And five times a day, you hear it. It's the call to prayer. This is the courtyard. Minarets. There is one God and He is Allah. You know, a lot of Christians find that kind of creepy, but it's very straightforward. There's one God, like God with a lowercase, like there's so many gods. There's one, and it is with a capital G. Allah means God. Of all the gods, there really is one, and He is God with a capital G, or in Arabic, Allah. And Muslims across the world use Arabic, just like Christians used to use Latin. There is one God, and if you're a monotheist, his name is God with a capital G, Allah. And you can go inside and pray, as Muslims are encouraged to do five times a day. Learning to celebrate the world in all its beauty and diversity. Happy travels. Our challenge in our travels is to, to not judge other ways of living in other faiths, but to try to understand other ways of living. There's a billion people, a billion good people who understand God through a Muslim prism. And when we travel in Islam, it's a royal opportunity to gain a better understanding of that. If we have a positive and constructive approach. And if we have a little context, that's one thing we like to do in our books and with our tours and with our TV shows is give American travelers context so they don't get freaked out by something, so they don't slam the door on it, but so that at least they understand as if they were a temporary local looking at it from the perspective of that culture. I just love this. Um, the, the mosques have beautiful tiles. And here we have the very holy, the most holy place in Islam for Muslims, uh, the Kaaba in uh, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And that's where everybody tries to make a pilgrimage to once time in their life. And you see that black stone, that black square stone there. And then in this sort of symbolic uh, old medieval piece of tile, you have all the mosques in a circle pointing to that central place that they all look to when they pray. And that is Mecca. Inside, just a beautiful, beautiful scene. And, uh, you know, everybody puts on a scarf out of respect. All the women put on a scarf. And everybody washes their, well, the locals, they wash their feet and they wash their elbows, they wash their hands and they wash their face. This is a, a modern ablush, ablution, I think it's called, a place where people, worshipers can wash uh, before they go into the mosque. And then you step out into the teeming street. And this street is just like it was pretty much when I traveled here as a kid. I love losing myself in these back lanes where everybody's doing their shopping. And then you walk downhill until you get to the Spice Bazaar. And the Spice Market is a hit with the travelers. And that was the end of my six days in Istanbul. I had two guides every day who were from Lolly and Tan's team. And then on that last day, I had six guides that I didn't know. 
and I auditioned them to get into our books. But these are the guides that lead our tours around Turkey. And I just had a delightful time with them. Ton and Lolly just know how to, you know, judge character. That's for sure. And we had uh, a wonderful last dinner in a gourmet restaurant. It was a Michelin star restaurant. And that was our chef back there in the black t-shirt. And, uh, you know, he was giving everybody martinis. And they said, what, what kind of martini do you want? And I said, I want Rocky. And I won his heart by saying, I don't need no stinking Cosmo or something. I want myself a Rocky. And he, and all, then the, this end of the table, we all got our Rocky. And then he explained to me how an important ingredient of Rocky is conviviality, community, friends, getting together. Ah, that is really it. Sherefe. Sherefe. And he cooked us some beautiful food. Wow. Oh, delightful. And then we walked through that city, through the night of that city, over the bridge, and I went back to my hotel. If you want more on Istanbul, Lali, the woman who set up our who sets up our tours and co-authors uh, my Istanbul book, it's me and Lali on this thing. Um, we've got a whole hour of her of her uh, show on Monday Night Travel. It goes back to November of 2022. If you look in our archives, you can learn a lot more about Istanbul with Lali herself. Hey, there's a nonstop flight from Istanbul to Seattle, 12 hours. I was so thankful to get on that flight. Beautiful way to get back home. And then flying into Seattle, saw my beloved San Juan Islands. And then I went from Istanbul to the Emerald City here in the beautiful Northwest. It's good to get home. And now I'm spending this whole week working on Istanbul because that thing is filled with little scribbles. And I got to shuffle those and massage those into the book. So edition number nine will help you turn your travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. Hey, I want to remind you, I've had a great year of travel this year. Uh, I did Iceland and Nordic Europe um, earlier, uh, a month ago. And if you want to check that out, just go back into our archives. It was just like two months ago, I hosted a Monday Night Travel, which was just like tonight's uh, show, except different countries all across Northern Europe, and had a good time sharing with you some open face sandwiches, as we did Iceland. What a country to check out. Wow. And as we did the great capitals of Scandinavia, Copenhagen, uh, Stockholm, and Oslo. Uh, also, I got to visit with my relatives, as I have been now for 50 years. This was 50 years ago. And visiting my uncle Tor, that was a good trip, I'll tell you. And this was 50 days ago, visiting Uncle Tor. Same train station, same drill. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to have family to visit in your travels. And now we've got another one of our Rick Steves guidebooks up to date so that you can learn from our experience and travel smarter. I want to remind you, we've spent a lot of time in the last few years working on our art series and it's debuting all over the United States of America starting next week in 12 half hours. It's our new 12th season of Rick Steves Europe and it's all art, half hour art, and uh, you'll see it on your local channel. Stay tuned for that. Uh, in the next couple of months, in every state, in every city, in the country, Rick Steves Europe, it's all the art of Europe coming up this fall. And there's going to be a lot of travelers using those books, learning from our experience, so they can travel smoother and travel better. All right. Boy, I was long-winded, Julia, Julianne, but it was sure fun to share all that information. It was, Rick. I loved hearing about your fall trip. Yeah. <laughs> You know, my, my family doesn't really want to hear about my travels anymore. I keep coming home. God, don't want to see my slideshow. But I know you guys do. And so does our Monday night travel. So we're all family. And I love to share my experiences that way. And I hope it gave people some good ideas. I think so. And we have some great questions tonight, Rick. But before we get to those, could we have a word from our sponsor? Sure. A word from our sponsor. Um, well, first of all, I want to remind people that you are a very talented musician, and I just love the music you make. I've, we have 100 people on our staff, and it's just everybody has their passion, and I'm a musician, and I want to let people know that you've got an album. It's, on, uh, it's, it's, it's out. And millions of people, I suppose, would like to hear it, but they don't know about it. It's called Goodbye, Forget Me, and uh, a lot of people I know really, really uh, are fans of everybody on our Monday Night Travel team. We couldn't do this without you guys. And we got Gabe, we got uh, you, Julianne, we've got Lisa, and we've got uh, Ben. And uh, Gabe has put your, a link to your album um, 
in the in the notes, hasn't he? So when people get links to everything I've been talking about, they'll also find a link to your music. So uh, I hope people can check out Julianne's music. Uh, so that's a word from not our sponsor, but from my appreciation of your talent and your music. Uh, and uh, otherwise, um, what's the word from our sponsor at Rick Steves Europe? We're just jamming this year. It's so much fun. I'm I'm just fresh back from Europe, so I'm just sort of energized. But um, I would say if you got a trip coming up, go to ricksteves.com and there's a world of information there. Our free audio tours, our TV shows, our classroom Europe for teachers, our updated guidebooks, all of our uh, accessories and gear, uh, and of course our tour program. Uh, this is turning out to be our best year ever. I believe we've surpassed our 2019 numbers. We're very thankful for that. Our guides are doing a great job. There's still a little COVID out there, so be careful. Uh, we've taken 30,000 people on our tours th this this year. When when all the dust has settled, we will have taken 30,000 people on about 1,200 different tours. And it looks like we're going to have had a 2% COVID rate. Uh, so one out of 50 people do get COVID on the tours. Uh, that's, that's a shame, but it's nowhere near what it was last year. And we're on a good trajectory and uh, Europe is just a great time to be traveling. So if you have any curiosity about that or any interest, you can get a hold of us at ricksteves.com and we'd love to be part of your upcoming trips. All right. Thanks, Rick, for that music shout out. Mark said you mentioned the song Do Your Maker by Led Zeppelin. He said in the comments, his whole life he's been pronouncing it Dyer Maker. <laughs> so he said thank you for that. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, Dyer Maker, Dyer Maker, it's a weird spelling, but yeah. it's a great tune. Yeah. And it's, it's got the coolest drum beat. So I passed it by Zuzu and and he nailed it. It's really good. And I, I thought he had known that song, but he had never heard it before. Yeah. So that was really fun. I just know the album cover for that one. I think they're on the um, Giant's Causeway in Ireland Ooh. and there's some weird babies That's or right. something on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of those hippies, man. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, back to the show. Um, our first question is from Jesse. And uh, he was wondering, we know you have a small camera crew, just you, Carl and Simon, which we saw you filming in Poland. Have there been, been any big changes to how you film over the last 20 years? Uh, the biggest change is cameras are more light sensitive, so we can shoot almost in the dark. Uh, the little camera that we use to go and kind of sneak around uh, is almost, it's virtually broadcast quality. The downside about the little camera is you don't have the steadiness of a big camera, you don't have the power of the lens, uh, and you don't have good audio. You have reasonable audio for just um, kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the general uh, ambiance, but you can't do an on camera in front of it well. So when I'm talking, I got to talk to the big camera. The big camera is preferable, but we can use that little camera in places that would just amaze you. We also have a drone. That's a huge difference. And uh, I got to admit, we have a teleprompter. And uh, I went 30 years without a teleprompter and I had to memorize every line. And I did the whole first Poland show with no teleprompter. I was very proud because <laughs> it's hard to memorize those things because you got so much going on. But sometimes it's a drag to have to uh, put on the teleprompter and everything. But it is a godsend when you've got a long on camera and you got a lot of chaos all around you because so many things have to go right. And I can get it right, but then something else is wrong and then I got to get it right again. But when I've got the teleprompter, I get it right every time. And then we can work on all the other issues. So the big change in our filming is, frankly, I spend whatever I need to spend to get a first class show, which I couldn't do before. Um, I dedicate extra days of filming so we can get all the beautiful shots. Gear is changed and it's so much better in quality now. Uh, and uh, it's lighter. So as we get older, the gear gets lighter. It's a great thing. <laughs> so we can still carry our gear. Uh, so there you go. That's how that's what's changed. The second question we you mentioned early on in the show, but quite a few people were wondering, like Bradley and Colleen, do you see many signs of Ukrainian refugees in Poland? You know, I got to say, I really don't. I know there's a lot of refugees uh, from a lot of places in Europe. America doesn't know what refugees are. You know, America, we, we freak out because there's a few thousand refugees coming into our country. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of refugees in Europe and they embrace these people. They embrace these people and, and they contribute to their society and they have a different religion and they've got a few bad apples in that group. And, you know, it might be stressful in some ways, but but they're so humane and America is so frightened and greedy in so many ways. I got to excuse me here, but it's just, you know, there's going to be refugees. 
the way we're screwing up the environment, you don't know what refugees are. In our lifetime, we're going to have so many refugees. So either we better find another planet to live on, or we better get used to it. Um, or we better do something about the, the reason that things are uh, destabilized. And it's ironic to me that the people that are most freaked out about refugees are the people that refuse to deal with climate change. Because if you hate refugees, the most important thing for you to do so your kids don't have to deal with refugees is to get serious about climate change. Not tomorrow, today. How did I get on that rant? Um, oh, it was refugees, yeah. Um, there is a lot of people being housed in Europe, but as a tourist, you don't go to those places, you see. So I was struck by, I was in Poland. I did a TV show, one hour on Poland, you know, but we saw a very sheltered look at Poland, its greatest cities, its most historic buildings, its wonderful museums, and so on. And that's how tourism is. It's a city, it's a, it's a vast country with a lot of industrial, economic, refugee, reality kind of stuff going on. And tourists go to the beautiful corners. We just follow the Vistula River from Krakow all the way to the Baltic. Uh, but um, countries handle their refugees, they absorb their refugees, and it's not a piece of cake, but they do a darn good job at it. And they're not putting them on buses and sending them to other cities in their country. They're not shipping them off to a city because they have different politics. These are people, there's a lot of money, and those people are desperate. And if they have any decency at all, Americans, they take care of them. One of my favorite things in Poland that you showed us tonight was the salon concert that you had with Chopin. And um, June was wondering if you could see any composer live, like Chopin, if you could see him actually play, what composer would you want to see in a salon concert? Hmm. Franz Liszt is uh, the been a wild man. I mean, he was the Elton John of the 1800s, you know, and uh, <laughs> Franz Liszt would have been great. Franz Liszt, he was so into musicality, tonality, you know, getting it right. This was before anybody ever thought about atonal music. The, the legend was when he was very tired and he wouldn't get out of bed, his wife would play the first seven notes of the scale. Bum, 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 bum. He couldn't handle it. He had to get out of bed and play bum. That's tonality. And that's, uh, and to have him playing, appreciating all of that, that's something. Um, my daughter and I's favorite thing was to play Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony for four hands, transcribed by Franz Liszt. That was great. But that was a, a Beethoven symphony for four hands designed for a community that would never see a symphony. And that's what's, what you're talking about, Julianne, I think, and, and I've been talking about it. a salon is what a humble town, a, 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 a town that's not the center of the culture, that's the best they've got under a chandelier. I love, my dad used to import and sell pianos. When I was a kid, I worked in this piano shop and I was always romant, romanced by uh, chandelier uh, holders on an upright piano because that was before they had electric lights and they'd have candles, candelabra, and they'd play the piano with the community gathered around. It's a beautiful thing. Now we just, we just uh, shazam it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a bit less romantic, yeah, today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a little less romantic. <laughs> let's see here. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay. And you also mentioned this, but quite a few, few people did ask. Uh, Dave was wondering, even with all the police presence and the barriers, would you still consider Istanbul a safe place to visit? Absolutely. There's no homelessness that I saw. No homelessness in Poland either. Um, I, I mean, petty, petty uh, purse snatching if you're a rich tourist and stuff. But I felt very safe in Istanbul. And I felt like people would look out for you. And I felt very safe in Poland too. You can find trouble anywhere. I mean, Istanbul is a city of 20 million people. There's lots of problems and tourism by the nature of tourism, we don't go to the trouble zones. But um, I think one reason Erdogan is popular <clears throat> or accepted, let's say he's not popular, he's accepted, is because he makes the country stable and safe. And 
If somebody was going to trade away democracy in our society, it would probably be for the slogan, law and order. That's a right wing trick, by the way. They promise law and order. And then you have police on the corner and they got no, no freedom of the press. And you've got law and order, but you better stay in line. But why not experience that as a traveler? Why not go to Turkey and talk to people? That's the beautiful thing. That's what I love. And that's what we, we encourage our guides to take advantage of this opportunity. The standard wisdom for tour companies in Europe is don't talk religion, don't talk politics, and don't talk soccer, because it's just going to cause people to fight, you know. I say responsibly, respectfully, thoughtfully grapple with complicated issues that may deal with politics and religion and even football. Um, and it, it guides love it, love permission to be able to talk about these things. It comes from my heritage of taking tours to Central America, where we had what we called reflections times, where we would get together with our guide and we would just share ideas and, uh, and explore our questions and what our confusion and to better understand that society on its terms, in its reality, not from our privileged reality, but what's it like to live in that corner of the world, you know? Well, to make that talking a bit easier is bison vodka, I think, bison grass vodka, which Ross said is available at Total Wine for $25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's where I got this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I'm gonna have to go back down because uh, <laughs> there's only a dribble left. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Bison <Yes. grass. laughs> 25 bucks. That's a lot of fun for 25 bucks. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, Rick, we have time for one more question. And that is from John. And he's wondering, we saw quite a few cities in Poland tonight that have been rebuilt um, since they were bombed during the war. And how does it feel visiting still a city that has been rebuilt after such a difficult time? It makes me feel old because most people on the street don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue. It's so long ago. It's in the history books. It's like our civil war. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm tuned into history. I'm tuned into the lessons of history. I'm a teacher and a tour guide, and I want people to think about it. But local people are so far beyond that. What it does remind me is the resilience of societies, how you can be hit and you can rebuild and you can be friends with the people who hit you. That's what strikes me as amazing. Not that the, not that the cities are rebuilt, but that the cities are rebuilt and filling the hotels are Germans on vacation. And it's not an issue. Ha! Huh. I think that's quite remarkable. And I didn't just see cities that were rebuilt. I went to a country that was totally destroyed that was not on the map for 100 years, that was pushed this way by the Russians and then that way by the Prussians and then this way and that way. For a century, it didn't even occur on the map. And then in World War II, before World War II, between the two wars, it had its little glory day of independence and then bam, caught between Russia and Germany again. Rebuilt after 1945 with American help and today thriving and today a leading player in the European Union. It's a fascinating story. Why would somebody not want to learn about that and be inspired by it and to feel good about making their society sparkle also? European societies sparkle. We should think about that when we deal with the challenges of our, of our, our situation politically right now in our country. Was that our last question? That was the last question. Oh. <laughs> I'm just going to have to drink alone. <laughs> do we still have anybody still out with us? Yeah, we still do. We have a lot of people yeah. still with us. You said there, Rick, friends with the people who hit you. That's so nice and so simple. Yeah. Powerful. Mm -hmm. I've never said that before, but that's the fun thing about talking and sharing these ideas. Hey, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Next week, we're going to the Peloponnesian Peninsula with Nikki, one of my favorite guides in Greece. So join us on Monday Night Travel. And um, remember, if we can be part of your travels, we're right here <laughs> with a nice empty bottle of bison grass vodka. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Julianne. Happy travels.
Good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.